All right, I'm just giving it one more minute. Uh, let folks trickle in from the waiting room. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kelly Talby. I'm the Director of Communications and Development uh, with Kentucky Voices for Health, and we are a Thrive Kentucky campaign partner. Uh, here you can see uh, some of our premier cohort uh, members, and we'll kind of get a little more into uh, the Thrive Kentucky campaign for those who might be new to us today. Um, last year, we wrapped up a big roadshow. Uh, many of you all joined us. And this will be another year where we do come and visit you in person. It won't be at the frequency. We won't be on a weekly schedule, but starting in April, there will be a one per month uh, visit and we'll be, um, oh, I apologize. Can you all not hear me? Sorry, I just saw the chat. No, okay, you can't, okay. Yeah, we can hear you. F false alarm. Uh, so starting in April of this year, we will uh, be kicking off some roadshow stops that is in addition to these virtual webinars that we bring to you monthly. Um, so stay tuned for uh, more information about that. Today is a quarterly virtual format that we do in conjunction with the Cabinet for Health and Family Services. And um, we're really excited to have a bunch of folks on the call with us today. I think we'll be joined soon by Deputy Secretary Carrie Banahan. Uh, we have the Department for Medicaid Services Senior Deputy Commissioner Veronica Judy Cecil. Uh, we have the Director of the Division of Family Support Todd Trapp with us today. The Division of Child Care Director Andrea Day. Uh, we will be joined by Department of Public Health Deputy Commissioner Dr. Connie White. Uh, we have Branch Manager for the Office of Health Equity Vivian Lastly Bibbs. And I'm looking to make sure I didn't forget anyone from our CHFS leadership team. Um, I think that's it. But we want to bring these um, to you in an effort to create more dialogue between the cabinet leadership, consumers, advocates, and the work that we all do. We really want these forums to be an opportunity for you to get the latest information for public assistance programs. Um, and how it affects you directly, the individuals you serve, and the safety nets that supports families, workers, um, and have an opportunity to share feedback, questions, get direct answers. Um, and I know many of you all are regulars. Uh, you join us month to month and know Thrive Kentucky well, but for anyone joining us, um, so I'll go on to the next slide. Thrive Kentucky, um, our mission is to meet the basic needs of every Kentuckian through systemic change. Uh, we recognize that many of our fellow Kentuckians face historical and systemic barriers to meeting their basic needs. Um, so to eliminate those barriers, we focus on anti-racist, anti-poverty policies that will lead to a more equitable and just commonwealth for every Kentuckian. Uh, you can learn more about our members um, here and see our principles that guide the work. Um, and then here is our leadership members for the Thrive Kentucky campaign. A quick shout out to our 2023 sponsors, not 2022. Sorry, I am still on the past. Uh, United Healthcare and Humana Healthy Horizons has joined on for 2023 sponsorship of this series. If you are interested in uh, being a 2023 sponsor, please email me. Um, let's talk. I'll be reaching out to you anyway soon. Um, so let's just go ahead and get that out of the way. Here's our agenda for the day. Uh, this, this month, we are giving a little more emphasis and attention to the public health emergency ending um, and what that means for Medicaid renewals. Um, so there will be a lengthier initial presentation. Typically, we try to make them even. So don't be alarmed if it feels like we're going extremely long. I promise we're not going to keep you for five or six hours. Um, and then we will get into the rest of the agenda here. Um, I will be sharing this slide deck in an email to follow, but to our roadshow and virtual updates for the remainder of the year, we wanted you to have them in a single location with the links ready to go and the dates. So that's all these slides are. You'll get these again so that you have them. Um, a few housekeeping measures. Um, we do have a lot of folks on the call today, so try to keep yourself muted. 
Um, as individuals are presenting, feel free to drop your questions directly into the chat. Uh, we will try to get to them in live time, but if for some reason we're not able to get your question answered uh, during the webinar today, we'll try to follow up with you in writing tomorrow or soon. Um, we do want this to be a robust conversation that um, helps the work that you all do and the people you all serve. Um, if you are a social worker or certified community health worker, uh, be sure to email me after either during today's program or afterwards, once you've completed our evaluation that you'll get in an email, um, make sure that we see that you've completed it so that I can get you a continuing education certificate. There's just all of our contact information and I'm going to stop sharing um, and introduce Ms. Kara Stewart and Priscilla Easterling, who will you, you kick off access to those questions. our first the LRC, portion of the agenda. That's right, because I'm just on your Thank you, Can you mute? There is a lot of background noise. Thank you. Um, Kara is obviously doing the Kara thing, being at the legislator, uh, a legislative office at the Capitol. So she is busy and I'm so glad that she was able to join us today. Um, so she and I are gonna tag team this, sec uh, this section. Um, my name is Priscilla Easterling. I'm an outreach coordinator for Kentucky Voices for Health. Um, and we're going to talk about the unwinding and planning for Medicaid renewals. So over the last two years, almost three during the pandemic, um, Medicaid renewals have been paused. There's something been in place called the maintenance of effort provision, which has essentially meant that folks have anyone who has applied and enrolled in Medicaid over the last three years has remained uh, has remained in Medicaid, under, covered under Medicaid, um, and unless they have moved out of state, asked for their coverage to end, or passed away, they've stayed covered under Medicaid. Um, but it was originally tied to the public health emergency, um, but because of the omnibus bill that was passed back in December, it set a timeline beginning April 1st. And so now Medicaid renewals are upon us and those are getting ready to start again. So we'd love to, we're really excited to have uh, Deputy Commissioner Veronica June Cecil here to talk about the state's plan and how all of that is uh, gonna work this year. Thank you. And um, I didn't wanna say Commissioner Lee is, is on as well. So you've got, um, actually have the team Medicaid on on uh, the call today. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide uh, Medicaid's current plan. Um, this is very lengthy. I, I could spend five hours uh, talking about all the things, um, uh, public health emergency unwinding. Um, today, I'm going to focus a lot on the renewals. Uh, I think that's where a lot of folks um, have maybe the greatest interest right now, um, it, but understand that you know we are now with um, a recent announcement by the White House that they're going to end the public health emergency on May 11th. We're now quickly shifting to also include um, the additional effort that comes with unwinding the flexibilities that we put into place to place that are non-eligibility. Um, so uh, as um, Priscilla mentioned earlier and gave a, a great background on uh, the public health emergency itself, I won't spend time on that, but a recent uh, federal law is requiring us to restart Medicaid renewals. We have three primary goals for um, our renewal efforts. One is to comply with CMS, very important. Our um, federal matching uh, funds require us to stay in compliance. We want to prevent administrative termination. So that probably is our biggest concern here is, is um, in our opinion, an um, uh, administrative termination that's done for somebody who in essence is eligible for Medicaid is not okay. And we're really going to try to prevent those from happening through a lot of outreach and support. Um, if somebody is no longer eligible, for the various reasons um, that make them not eligible for Medicaid any longer, then we also wanna make sure they get moved to other coverage. And that's our third goal, transitioning ineligible folks to um, other co coverage available to them. This is a really high level of our um, timeline for renewals. Uh, as noted, um, 
we have tomorrow due to CMS, our renewal distribution plan. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, and what's called a system artifacts. Um, those are just the documents that really will explain to CMS the steps that we're taking um, in our system, our testing plan. Um, they just wanna make sure states are being very thoughtful about um, how the system has to be, um, system changes that are required for us to unwind. Um, as noted, uh, continuous coverage does end on March 31st, and so states have 14 months from that date to, to, um, to perform all uh, redeterminations or renewals. They, they're used interchangeably. Um, so in um, Medicaid, we are going to start that with a um, with those who have a renewal end date of May 31st. So May renewals will be the first month subject to uh, an annual uh, redetermination. We are required, uh, just to back up to April, uh, we are required in April, on April 8th, to submit to CMS what is our baseline report. And that really just sort of um, gives them a snapshot of what our numbers look like prior to unwinding. So that'll have all the data of our population, um, of, of the people that have come on during the unwinding and um, how many um, you know, people will be uh, subject to the renewal per month. That is a snapshot that we have to give to CMS every month. Um, we do plan to share publicly a report showing this information so that uh, everyone, um, we're trying to be transparent about uh, where we are in the process, how many renewals we have, um, how many people have been renewed, how many um, have been administratively terminated, how many have moved to other coverage. So we do plan a lot of um, public information around the um, unwinding across the 12 months. So May is the beginning of our renewals, um, and then those will again occur over a 12-month process uh, ending in April um, for that restart um, of unwinding. This I'm not going to go over in detail, uh, but um, this just is a, is a snapshot of what that kind of high-level renewal process looks like, and it starts with sending a notice prior to somebody's renewal uh, month, letting them know, hey, it's your renewal month. Um, and so keep an eye out. Something's going to be coming to you in the mail or through other communications. Um, and so watch for that. Very important that you respond if, um, if there is an, a need for additional information. Um, we will, at the beginning of April, do a... Um, we'll try to uh, what's called passively renew. So we'll, we will do a, the system will automatically try to verify uh, our population that are subject to, to the May renewal to see if we can uh, go ahead and take care of that, that renewal without them having to take any further action. If we're able to do that in accordance with all the rules and regulations, then that person has to take no action. They will receive a letter, um, letting them know that they've been renewed. If we're unable to verify them, we will send a request for information to that person. And that is their opportunity to provide additional information to us um, to, to uh, allow us to continue with that eligib eligibility verification. There are um, uh, folks that are Medicaid that uh, are not, we are not able to passively renew through the verification process, they will receive a renewal packet instead. Uh, they're around the 1st of April, um, giving them the opportunity to complete that information or verify that information and send it back to us so that we can complete our eligibility determination. So those are the things that would ha be happening in April. Uh, in May, we'll uh, you know, start finalizing those May renewals all the way to the very last day of May, um, but then we'll start um, kicking in June renewals during that time, sending the same type of notifications for, um, for those folks who have a renewal date. So as you can see, um, again, this is just sort of a snapshot of what that timeline would look like. 
this, um, and I like to use the word snapshot because that truly is what, is it, what it is. This is a snap of a uh, shot of, of in time um, of our forecast of, of what we um, see in our data uh, to date. So what our system has been doing through this entire uh, public health emergency and with continuous coverage is uh, running in the background. They've been continuing to run the eligibility rules. Um, and that has allowed us to, to have a little bit of an insight into who likely is no longer eligible. Um, a lot of that might have to do with they, their income now exceeds and we can verify it and it exceeds uh, eligibility requirements. Um, perhaps they were uh, eligible due to um, some category and, and they're no longer in that category. So they, they lose their eligibility as a result of that, but we've been keeping everybody covered in the meantime. So when this says uh, est estimated total to lose eligibility of 243,000, that is saying that in our system, it's forecasting the potential of this population that may lose eligibility. Until we go through an actual verification when that person is subject to renewal, we won't know for certain. Uh, so this could um, very much mean that uh, there's fewer people uh, in this bucket that will actually be eligible once they go through a redetermination. So I always wanna make that clear. What we do see in our system of, of those individuals, that about 67,000 of them are over 138%. So go, that goes back to, we can kind of see already that their income is above 138. Um, so they will have the opportunity to find um, other coverage that could be a qualified health plan. And for those folks, we, we do plan a lot of wraparound and outreach to them to make sure they understand that and they know where to access this, that information, they know where to get assistance if they need it, um, to choose a plan. And then um, we're, you know, we just, we do, do plan a lot of outreach around that. We did try to show of the 234,000 what the age ranges are there. This is, it might be hard to see, we did try to, break down that 234,000 uh, into um, a little more categories to see, especially across our waiver population, um, racial and ethnic demographic to the extent that we have it. Um, so this is just a little bit of a sh showing of where uh, people fall within the categories for Medicaid eligibility. So renewal caseload planning, um, what we've been working on a lot over the past couple of months is um, how do we distribute the caseload across the 12 month um, um, unwinding period to not uh, overwhelm our workforce. Uh, we are sensitive to the fact that uh, our call center times um, you know, can be challenging. And, and um, now we're adding on top of that, the um, potential of somebody losing their eligibility. And we don't want that. So we're doing our best to try to forecast our caseloads across the 12 months, uh, keeping in mind things like um, as, as um, the holidays, um, you know, in December, we have shorter work uh, shorter work days, uh, fewer work days, and um, and so we plan to have the least caseload in December. Um, we have uh, made the caseload caseload a little lower in those first couple of months of May, June, and July, so that um, we can uh, make sure we can ramp up. Um, and then we also. Um, uh, decided to put the largest caseload towards the end of the unwinding to give us the ability to learn some lessons, determine our workforce capacity, and see where we need to ramp up uh, for, for that caseload towards the end. So we've really tried to be thoughtful and, and mindful of the impacts um, like open enrollment and, and other uh, external impacts to our ability to process those um, those cases. 
we have prioritized some of our population um, across the 12 months as well. And as noted here, so we have um, a population of about 14,000 that each month we've been doing what's called a special circumstance. So we have to go in each month and, and move these people um, to continue coverage. We do plan to, um, the, and these are folks that um, were determined ineligible right at the beginning of the public health emergency. Um, so that, that is a population in May that um, we will see lose coverage. Um, we decided to move the Medicare eligible, so uh, anyone age 65 and older, um, to the first six months to uh, provide some direct assistance to them to move into Medicare. Um, there will be a special enrollment period for those folks. They get six months following their uh, disenrollment from Medicaid to, to enroll in Medicare without a penalty. Um, we do plan a lot of outreach uh, with the, this population to make sure they, they get um, connected to somebody who can help them apply for Medicare. We do see in our, in our system right now, a lot of these folks already have Medicare. So we're really talking about a small population that will have to go through um, some, some kind of active um, enrollment into Medicare. And then we have decided for um, folks that are, that we see their income does make them qualified for a qualified health plan that uh, we're starting those in June. Um, after June, because we plan, we are in the process of implementing some system changes, some changes to our call center um, that will uh, help support these folks. So there are there are things we're implementing, and we want to have them in place and make sure they work uh, prior to those folks coming in, so um, they have the the support they need. Veronica, we've had a couple of questions that have popped up here in the chat. Um, there's a lot of folks that want to know if the estimates are going to be released by county, like the projected numbers. Yes, yes they will. Our, our report they, has it at the county level. All right. I'm going to put yes, they will. <laughs> <laughs> to answered it in the chat. Um, and then there's a couple of folks that um, talking about HCB waivers, you know, Michelle P. HCBS. Um, you know, going back into the, they're just going back into normalcy, back into normal redetermination. I just want to yeah. clarify that. That's There's correct. been some, some chat, chatter in the chat um, with some current concerns about that and what would happen to people who were, say, employed as a result of a waiver. And that just goes back into normal time. Right? It does. So those resume and those, those will be um, um, allocated across the 12 months. It's not going to all happen at once. We do plan a lot of um, outreach. We, we've been talking with our long-term services and sports division about outreach. Um, and so we're developing a plan to make sure that every single person um, in the HCB waiver that uh, is a that has a renewal knows the renewal is coming and has the support they need to make sure they follow the process. Awesome. I think that was the, the repeating questions. I think Miranda had a couple of questions. She wanted to know if the special circumstance for May refers to enrollees with um, emergency time limited Medicaid. So they, they will just, uh, it does not, it, um, they will, um, they, they will unwind within a period of time as well. And they will be given the two months to, to get into compliance for the every two month renewal. Okay. I think um, and then Miranda had another question that was also followed up with that, you know, the FFM has created a special enrollment um, period for people losing Medicaid and CHIP during the unwinding, right, all the way out through July of 2024, regardless of when their Medicaid ends. Mm -hmm. um, or is that something that we are going to be able to do or looking at also? That is correct. Um, I, I don't, we, we are still, I working. love getting good news on these. <laughs> we are, we're still working on the details to that. And, and certainly we'll release that information as we finalize um, the policy there, but yes, we are considering a special enrollment period for them as well. And there was awesome. a postpartum question, Carla, the postpartum one-year extension. Oh yeah. Um, I mean that, 
like the unwinding doesn't affect people that I mean it just you go into the same regular redetermination after your you know the same time after you would end, otherwise yeah after you're in your interview months. year so okay yeah thanks um Dr. White for watching the chat there and thanks for man I love getting to deliver good news um in these se sessions here so let's see Priscilla and you all I'm sorry for my background noise earlier I apologize for that um Let's see, Priscilla, what other questions did we still have? Oh, when will connectors and providers and MCOs be able to find a person's renewal date? In March, we will run, uh, we'll, we'll um, lay over our redetermination plan um, into the system. And that'll happen around March 15th. So towards the end of March, around March 25th, um, Everyone, including managed care organizations, should see the updated uh, in the updated um, redetermination date. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. And I wanted to clarify. Uh, so it sounds like everyone's going to get one. Everyone's going to get some notice over the next twelve months. They'll either receive a pass a notice saying you've been renewed, you don't have to take any action, or we need more information, and here's when to submit it by. Yep, that's correct. Okay, so every so everyone can expect to check their mail over the next twelve months and needs to look for out for that. We that's shouldn't right. target special populations or anything like that. That's right. Perfect. Um, and then a follow up question: You said that there's um, there is a special enrollment period for the Medicare eligible folks. Um, do you have an estimate of how, I, I thought I saw it in the numbers and maybe one of your previous slides, do you have an estimate of how many folks you think need to take action who would be eligible for Medicare? As, as best as we can forecast, it appears to be about 800 folks who have not signed up for Medicare. Okay. Cool. That's a, look of 800 of the 16,000 or so, that's a really- That's correct. Yes, we're, we're quite happy with that. <laughs> Um, and then Veronica, I know you said that county level breakdown is going to be available. And then uh, Bev Beckman wants to know how to be able to access that. Will that be on the website? It will be on our website. Yeah. So y'all, there is an unwinding website that I'm hoping is going to get repopulated with these slides that Veronica just yeah. shared with us because these slides <laughs> are so good. These visuals are so good. Um, okay. They answer so many questions. Yep. Um, yeah, so I know we're running out of time. Just real quick, social media and our website are really going to be the go-to places to find out what's the most current information uh, or what's happening in Medicaid. Um, so we and we will put uh, out on sh social media when we do put something on the website just to draw people back to uh, where you know where they can find the information. But we do plan again a lot of robust reporting. Uh, to keep folks um, in the loop. We plan some March stakeholder meetings. Those are the dates and times. Um, and then every month we will have, during the unwind, we will have a stakeholder uh, meeting to talk through what the data looks like, what our plans are, um, you know, just really kind of in general what's going on with unwind. Can you uh, give us an overview of some of the um, data that, CM that you have to report to CMS? Yes, um, and so it, it's about um, who's uh, who's subject to renewal that month, who was able to be renewed, um, who is who uh, has filed an how many have filed an appeal, um, how many appeals are beyond ninety days. Um, there's about seven key data, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm blanking on some of them. I'm sure, but <laughs> it that's kind of it's 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 more high level. We're gonna we are going to post a lot more detailed information down to the subpopulation um, because we know that's what uh, folks are interested in. At, at, for Medicaid, it's a pretty high level. Awesome, thank you. And those are and all of the all of those reports are going to be available on the website once that's you. Correct. Yeah, perfect. I love that. Transparency. I love to see it. Um, hey, Veronica or Commissioner Lee, don't feel rushed. Like today is your party. We are all team Medicaid today. <laughs> so everybody else gets shortened today. If you've got any other slides that you want to go through, you know, today is team Medicaid day. Um, Please. I saw some clicking and I was like, don't I know. Don't click. I know. I want to see it. <laughs> um, 
you know, I, I think, so what's next? What what can you tell people right now and that uh, members right now? And that is make sure your contact information is up to date. Please, 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 if possible, give us a phone number and an email as a secondary mode of communication. Um, that's going to be critical. You know, we're worried about returned mail. We want to be able to reach these individuals and make sure they know what's happening and um, that they need to take action. Uh, so that that's kind of a critical piece right now. Um, the other thing, well, so here it shows, you know, if you're 65 and older and need help with uh, signing up for Medicare, we're got, we are going to uh, work with those folks to make sure they understand um, the help they can get through um, through SHIP and through Dale, the Department for Aging and Independent Living, um, and um, you know we're going to connect people to a connector or an insurance agent for assistance. Um, these are flexibilities ending and I, uh, I think maybe we can come back another another time to talk through some of these because um, there's just there's a lot there. but the, the critical piece I think is communication and, and we do we really want to make sure everyone understands what's happening. How can they help somebody? That goes to our providers. We um, do plan a lot of uh, communication with our provider community, the provider associations, um, so that they can share information down through their memberships. And the the more we can inform people about what's happening, um, you know, I think the better we are in uh, and more successful we'll be in making sure somebody who goes through a renewal is. Um, is properly determined eligible or not. And then if not, what can we do to help them be connected to, to um, coverage? Um, so I think that was, that was it. <laughs> Emily just uh, asked in the chat, will the link to sign up for the three stakeholder meetings in March be available on the Unwinding website? It will, um, and and we should have that. We'll send out a social media notice, but um, we should have that available probably in the next week. Um, to start uh, for people to start choosing. I will say that the plan is to have the same information at each of the um, stakeholder meetings. There probably won't be a lot of difference. So people don't, you know, fear of missing out uh, if they if they don't attend one. Okay. And all of those meetings are virtual. That's correct. So. And then one last question in the chat, it looks like, uh, what will happen if you already received Medicaid and Medicare QMB? Has the income limit increased since Social Security uh, has received a raise? Um, yeah, so I, I know that's a little difficult for people because that I think does make them no longer eligible for some of the Medicaid coverage. And um, you know, certainly we're happy to answer those specific uh, questions. Um, I, I recommend somebody when they um, can see their renewal date that they contact uh, to find out what's exactly going to happen with them. Okay. Are there any other last minute questions? Otherwise, we can wrap this up. Kara, any other questions? No, just to say those slides were so good. Oh, thank you. I just, again, I know everybody's thinking it. I know everybody's like, what? This makes so much more sense to me. Thank you for all of the visual learners out there in the world. I yep. just absorbed it all. Good. <laughs> Great work to somebody. Um, okay. And again, yeah. since it is Team Medicaid Day, we can always come back. Our section never dies. But for now, we will give some other folks the opportunity to discuss um, uplifting topics like the flu and RSV and COVID. All right. Thank um, you all. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so that is my cue to segue us uh, from the public health emergency ending um, into our flu COVID RSV update. But I can say to that point, um, and I'll pass it up the virtual mic over to Dr. White um, and bring up her slides. Um, you know, the public health emergency ending also impacts the accessibility of vaccines and testing. And we are aware of this. Um, we don't feel that there's going to be any much change. Folks should not anticipate much changing if you use Medicaid or Medicare for your health insurance plans. However, commercial insurer to commercial insurer, uh, folks will need to reach out to their provider um, and make the direct ask because 
Some plans may choose uh, to continue offering uh, free and widely accessible uh, testing and vaccines. Others, things may change and costs may uh, begin to incur. But with that, I will pass it off to Dr. White. And Dr. White, I'll pull up your slides. Give me two seconds. Well, that is certainly a tough act to follow. Uh, thank you, uh, Veronica. That that was I just sent her a text and told her that even I followed everything that she said. So I'm uh, pretty pleased with that. So uh, I knew that we would have an uneven time today. I've got a lot of slides. These will be sent out to you. What I want to do is give you a snapshot of data and then tell you how you can find this because there's no need in me going over all this in great detail. We've worked very hard at, at DPH to try to make sure that every all the information, everything you're going to see today comes from a, a, I believe every slide, comes from a public facing website. So this is something you as a citizen it can have access to. So next slide. Uh, this is going to show you, and every week we have a flu report uh, that comes out, and uh, next slide, this shows you the purple line with the arrow, that is this year. So all of those other lines are other years, and so you can see that uh, for um, the 2019-2020, we were way up there at this time, uh, and we're way down at right now. Uh, I will tell you that most all of that is, is uh, A, um, the flu A, um, and uh, so B could surge at any time. Uh, we have had uh, eight deaths uh, in uh, citizens less than 18 years of age and 127 deaths for people over the age of 18. Uh, so that's our flu data. The next slide just gives you, again, for the visual learners out there, gives you a map. And this is on our weekly flu report uh, that shows you where it's high, where it's increasing, where it's decreasing, where it's plateauing. So you can see that just by ad district. Now, the next slide shows you the actual flu website. And so I have typed in there where it says 2023 three seasonal flu activity, you, tie, you can go in there and pick January. And when I tapped January, every week in January showed up. So uh, you can look at any week that you want to. You can go back and look at past years if you want to. That's a little further down. But the, the reason that that one week is black is because that's what I clicked on to get the information that you just saw in those last two slides. I will admit Kelly, that my links that I've got in these slides, if we're going to send them out to people, are not active because I'm not uh, savvy enough to do that. So if you can fix that, that'd be great. Or you can just type all those words in and you'll, you'll get the information, but it'll be something you can bookmark and go to regularly. So that's where we are with flu right now. Uh, the next slide shows you the dashboard uh, for COVID. Um, the... Um, this is the, the COVID dashboard. It gives you numbers of cases, numbers of death. It breaks it down by um, uh, age, um, uh, gender, ethnic, um, age, ethnicity, uh, race. Uh, and that's something that you can go to the website and find at any time. Uh, you can go down. It, it, there's, there's just all kinds of different tabs that you can click. On the bottom, that magenta looking line there, I, I, I didn't do cases, I did deaths. And I'm doing that because I want people to understand we are still having people die of COVID. I get an email every day and today we declared there were 14 deaths in Kentucky from COVID. So it is still happening out out there and uh, I have a co-worker whose best friend's mother just died two weeks ago got COVID immunocompromised was on a medication for that and uh, and she died so so I want people to be clear this is not where we were on those great big peaks that you also see in that magenta line there uh, but we do still see uh, COVID deaths uh, the next slide shows you uh, a, a combination of slides that the governor shows frequently the blue line are hospitalizations the uh, orange uh, uh, numbers are ICU and the black numbers are ventilator cases and and to see those numbers as small as they are compared to you see the peaks uh, with Delta with Omicron and with the original uh, 
it's bad for those 46 and 28 people, but we are seeing uh, a much better response. We think this is because of people that have been infected as well as people who've gotten uh, that bivalent uh, and other vaccines. Uh, the next slide, if you go to our COVID, uh, kycovid19.ky.gov, I didn't put it on this slide, it's on one of the next ones. But if you, uh, next slide or next click, right there where it says vaccine, if you go there, that's where most of the slides I'm going to show you today come from. And if you look at that left column, it's got all the different uh, updated, weekly updated data that you can look at. Uh, the next slide. This is the vaccine dashboard that you can go to that's on that list there. And that shows you where uh, and what I have clicked on this one. Um, up in the upper right hand corner, I looked at uh, additional doses. And what it's going to tell you is it's going to show you a breakdown by age of people that have gotten that additional dose. It's going to show you percentages. And then you can take your cursor, and that's for this whole state, you can co cover over each county. And you can get that very same breakdown by county if you are interested in where vaccinations are. You can also look at this uh, just by fully vaccinated, but but for us right now, those those additional doses is what we're most uh, concerned about. Uh, the next slide shows, um, again, the uh, KY, KY COVID there, I did put the website in on that one. Uh, and uh, click again, it shows you that if you go to uh, vaccine, that aren't that um, powder blue box, click again, there's an arrow that's going to show you where that is. That is how you can find out where you can get vaccine. So if you click on that box, and also to the right of that great big blue box, there's a, a there's a clicker that says transportation. And if you click on that, you can pick your county and you can find where people can get transportation if they want to go to have a vaccination done. Transportation is, is one of the hu hugest, I don't think that's a word, but I just made it one. It's one of the hugest barriers that everybody we work with has. So the transportation tool is really very helpful. So the next... Uh, if you click that powder blue uh, uh, oblong, the next box shows you what that looks like. The next slide shows you what that looks like. So I have put, click again, I have put my area code 40601. I can go down where it says updated vaccines. If I'm looking for a booster, if I click on that, it asks me what type I want, Moderna, Pfizer, whatever. And then I hit search and it's gonna show me everything within 50 miles or I can say 10 miles and it'll show me everybody in my area that's doing vaccination, whether it's a health department, a pharmacy, uh, FQHC, RHC, whoever's doing that. If I'm more interested in the primary vaccine, I can click on that little plus to the right, and that will again show me everywhere where I can get uh, a primary vaccine. So this COVID uh, vaccines.gov is, is a great tool if someone says, I don't know how to get vaccinated. Uh, the next slide is just to give you an overview. This is not Kentucky specific, but this is nationwide. The black line is showing deaths with people uh, who are unvaccinated. Uh, the turquoise line is people who have gotten vaccinated. And that green line are the number of deaths of people who have gotten the bivalent. Uh, vaccination. So we still have people that get the bivalent vaccination that are having deaths. These are the very, very ill, the fragile, the frail, the elderly, and the immunocompromised as a general rule. That's a CDC slide. Uh, the next slide, just to kind of put a bow on RSV. It's never gone. It's always there. It always has been. But this slide from the CDC shows you in the south uh, and and they, it's a, the way that they divide regions up, and this is what RSV looks like. So the, the magenta line and the blue line show different types of tests in the South. The South by uh, HRSA is kind of the SEC plus Oklahoma, Texas, North Carolina, Virginia, and West Virginia. So that bottom right-hand corner of the U.S. from Texas, Oklahoma on over. And that's what our number of cases look like. So you can go to that website and find that information by that region, or you can look at the whole US if you want to. 
And the final slide, and we've talked about talking about this, so I decided I would take this opportunity to talk about vaccines for children. Most of you on the slide on this uh, screen know who, what vaccines for children is, but it's a program that was created in August of 1993, so it's been around for a while. It's federally funded to ensure all children have access to all the life-saving vaccines. Uh, the VFC program uh, allows these uh, Vaccines to be given at no cost to eligible, eligible children through public and private providers. And the beauty of that is they can get it in their medical home. So they don't have to go somewhere else. So all of the vaccines that they pay for are recommended by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, ACIP, uh, and they are available through the VFC program. So it keeps these kids in the home, a uh, medical home. Uh, and this covers children and adolescents younger than 19. They need to be either Medicaid eligible, underinsured, American Indian or Alaskan Native, uh, or uninsured and they have definitions for what the underinsured means on their website. So we have the FC uh, uh, officers that go that are the states divided. We've got people visiting different providers to be sure they get their questions answered, that they're storing these vaccines correctly, that they're following these recommendations so we can continue to get this federal funding for this uh, critical, important program. So I'll stop now. I told uh, Kelly I'd get this done in 10 minutes because I wanted to have plenty of time to, to cover all the other issues, and I can't really talk and look at the chat at the same time. So Kelly, what is there anything I missed? Or are there any questions? No, you, you did great. The, we do have a question. Um, if a patient or client is up to date with the original series and boosters, this is for COVID-19 specifically, when do they need to get another booster shot? Well, that's a good question, because it's been six months since I had my booster shot in September. And uh, I keep asking our state epidemiologist, has the CDC said anything about a, a, a booster to the booster? Uh, I'm immunocompromised. I'm, I'm obviously over 50 uh, and I have rheumatoid arthritis. So I want an immunosuppressive drug. So I'm getting kind of antsy. It's been six months. I haven't had a vaccine. That recommendation has not come out yet. I wouldn't be surprised if they're going to make this annually for the general population, but maybe more frequently for those of us that are immunocompromised because of medications. But at this point in time, there is not anything uh, making that recommendation. I wouldn't be surprised if there are not um, oncologists who are recommending this to some of their cancer patients that are on powerful chemotherapy medications. Uh, but as far as the CDC recommendation and FDA recommendation, there have been no recommendations about boosting your booster as of February the 14th. CDC is great to, at five o'clock on Friday afternoon, send out a, a new recommendation so we could get it this Friday. I don't know. But as of today, there's not any recommendation uh, for that. It's a great question. Thank, thank you, Dr. White. And um, I, like you, am hopeful that uh, before May the 11th, even if it's at five o'clock on May the 10th, that the CDC issues a lot of those recommendations and guidance that I think a lot of folks are going to be waiting on. Um, so if anyone has any additional questions, just drop them into the chat. And with that, I'm going to pass the virtual mic off to Dustin Pugel with KY Policy. Hey, y'all. Uh, Dustin Pugel with KY Policy. I'm the policy director there, and we are going to um, shift gears and talk about a new report that the cabinet has come out with that I'm very excited about. Um, I know one thing that we harp on a lot uh, within Thrive uh, is this idea that uh, we need to consider the health implications of all policies. Um, we know that every type of public policy, that every type of law that's passed has an impact on our health. Um, and we also know that it has an impact uh, based off race. And so something that the cabinet has done historically and that they've now uh, refreshed is a really incredible, rich report on um, the health of our state by uh, race and ethnicity. It's called the Minority Health Status Report. Um, we have Vivian Lasley Bibbs here with the Health Equity Branch of the Kentucky Department for Public Health, who gave a great presentation on this recently in the House uh, health, uh, I'm sorry, the Senate Health Committee uh, recently, and I thought it was so good that um, she could do it again here. So, uh, Vivian, without further ado, why don't you walk us through what's in the report? All righty. 
So I'm gonna to try to be just as um, fast as Dr. White. And let's see if you all let me know if you can see my screen. Can you see the slides over here, hopefully? Yes, ma'am. All right. So why is it not moving? Why are my slides not moving? Dr. White jinxed me. No, I'm teasing. I don't know why. Hey, Kelly was driving my PowerPoint, so. Yeah, I, 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 I take no responsibility. Oh, okay. So um, I guess I have to hit it twice. So the Minority Health Status Report, I apologize, I have a little laryngitis. Um, I'll try to be quick because I know that we want to get through uh, for all of our speakers today. So the Minority Health Status Report um, is a biennial report produced in odd years by Kentucky statute. Um, we try to provide the most current data describing the data disparity data that exists across the state. Um, we use multiple data sources. We use our Kentucky Behavioral Risk Factor Survey data, Census, American Community Survey, and other measures of um, population health. So in 2021, uh, this report highlights the disparities affecting Kentuckians, and it provides recommendations on how we can improve the health outcomes of our constituents across the state. Um, we want it to be a resource tool for communities to start conversations around social determinants of health. We also want it to be a tool for our legislators, of course, to start thinking about as they propose bills and they start thinking about um, policy, um, what does the data show already? And moving forward, as we think about um, looking at future legislation, are there tools that we can use in addition to this report to help us determine if we're disproportionately impacting one group over the, over the other? And this also provides um, support for our 2021 state strategic plan within the Department for Public Health as it impacts the health and well being of our uh, constituents across the state. And so, when we think about disparate health outcomes, um, all of us know they've been linked to cultural and linguistic barriers, access to services, your economic and finance capacity, your, the fragmented delivery of services some of our own personal biases and systemic and institutional barriers. And when we think about health equity, it exists not in, as a monolith, but across multiple dimensions, gender, race, income, sexual orientation, immigrating, immigration status, social connectedness, and the like. So the, the report itself is comprised of um, not only these components, but these are the main ones that have, have the meat of the data which is a demographic section, um, social risk factor section, a health risk factor section, health outcomes. And then we also have what we call health equity moving forward, which is recommendations that we're making um, to our legislators and to the public to, to say, these are the things that we see that, that are some of the short-term wins and some of the long-term wins as we address inequities in the Commonwealth. So this is an example of what the report contains. Uh, it can be found on the OHE webpage, and it can be found on the CHFS intranet. So the demographics of Kentucky, most of you know, it's 86.7% um, white, 8% um, African American. Most of the Black and Asian populations reside in the following counties listed, um, Fayetteville, Christian Hardin, Jefferson, Shelby, and Warren. And some of those social risk factors that we talked about um, that I'm sure Dr. White and some of you all are passionate about are our ACEs and our adverse, or our adverse childhood experiences. Um, and we're one of the leading states for that, 62.7% for us. And, it's gone, uh, and it has gone up since 2018 to now 65%. And I'm sure we'll see additional as we go through the 2020, 2023 report that we're currently preparing for. I anticipate we may see a, 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 an additional increase. Um, it's also known that health outcomes have been linked to home ownership. Our state Kentucky data shows that Black and American Indian, Alaska Native, and Hispanic Kentuckians are more likely to be renters than homeowners. Um, and some of those health risk factors deal with obesity in our state. Um, we know we, we, lead one of, we lead the pack in having overweight and obese populations especially in our minority populations. And then we are also known in our state for those that are um, have a, a disability of some sort. 
that 35.1% of adults in Kentucky that have a cognitive um, um, disability or a mobility dis uh, disability or those that are in independent living that still have something that keeps them from being able to um, ambulate or be, um, or be on, on their own. Uh, compared with 26.7% in the U.S., our number is 35.1%. So we're also looking at how to incorporate more of that data into the next report. <clears throat> and then health outcomes. Um, one thing I will say, we are doing well in our preventive screenings. Our minority population, we're doing much better with our preventive screenings than our majority population. But uh, um, in our health outcomes, it seems that our Hispanic and black populations have been told more than our white counterparts that they have diabetes. And we know that diabetes is one of those um, risk factors in, in minority populations that um, vision loss of limb uh, is highest. So why do we care about this? And this is where I think the meat is, the rubber hits the road. If we're really gonna talk about inequities, we have to talk about how they're all interconnected and we have to collaborate and form partnerships to do it. Um, none of this happens in a vacuum. The relationship between SES and your environment, your literacy level, existing policies, all impact health outcomes. Um, it allows us to, to talk about inequities um, in different ways, the intersection of those. It's not a, it's a race and gender, not race or gender or it's race and a disability, not race or a disability, the intersection of those and how that intersection gets exacerbated with people when we continue to stratify by other categories. And it, it's, it poses an extreme hardship on certain populations in geographical areas across our state and even in our urban areas. So we, to talk about those social determinants of health, we talk about targeting universalism which is really using targeted interventions to help all different subpopulations attain the same goal. Sometimes we think when we talk about equity, people seem to, to, to be on the defensive thinking that if we address an inequity within one population, that's gonna take something away from them. It's not, it's just creating that goal and then recognizing the subtle nuances and the social norms and cultures that help us all reach the same goal, but in different ways. So we've got to understand the root causes as well, those institutional and structural barriers, the isms, ageism, sexism, genderism, ableism, racism, all those things that continue to perpetuate health disparity. And I love this slide, um, talking about where we were um, in addressing population health. We used to really just think about the health outcomes and talk about the symptomology and what we need to do and how we um, think of putting a Band-Aid on things. And then we started talking about social determinants and we've been talking about them for a long time. And I think we, we had gotten stuck until the pandemic said, oh, we've got to look past the midstream factors and social determinants and really look upstream and talk about what are those social and institutional inequities related to policy and those isms that I mentioned that are really impacting the health and wellness of population. So if we want to really talk about addressing health disparities, we've got to all come together and stop functioning in our silos and talk about how we can really address social injustices and those inequities that are drive disparities. Think of those unjust circumstances that have been based on race and gender, income, et cetera. <clears throat> and we know that everyone deserves to have um, optimal health regardless of your zip code. Who I got through with less than voice, any questions? I know that was fast. But you did amazing. You did really, really well. Um, we mostly we just have me cheering you on in the uh in the okay, good. I don't have any questions. Uh good, I'll stop sharing. <laughs> unless anybody has any now. I just will say if I we're preparing the 2023 report, if there are things as you look at this report that you didn't see that you think should be included. We're talking about that now. We're even trying to put um, to put more of an infographic spin on the report. So there's more visual, there's more things for you to take away and look at. We're even thinking about doing a one pager to kind of summarize some of the highlights in an executive summary form for this report so people can have that one thing 
that they take with them when they go to talk to their constituents and when they go to talk to their legislators <clears throat> that they can use. So there are multiple ways we are working to improve the report. So please shoot me your ideas as you go through it and say, I wish I'd seen this. I wish I'd seen something else. So I'm always open to making that report better. And I don't want it to sit on a shelf and be used. But thank you, Dustin. And thank you all for the opportunity to share. <clears throat> well, I hope everybody takes that as an open invitation to email Vivian with your good ideas. Um, and I'll say too, we've included links to those reports in the chat, but we'll also include links in the email tomorrow. Um, and then also stay tuned. I, I hear there will likely be more in-depth look uh, looks at the this report, the 2021 report during the interim. It sounded like um, Chairman Meredith was interested in um, holding more of those meetings. So I think we'll get to hear more about it from uh, from Vivian and others then. So with that, I think it's my turn to hand it off to someone else. I don't remember who off the top of my head. Behavioral health. Huh? So it's me, Marcy Timmerman, Executive Director of Mental Health America of Kentucky. Really just here to introduce um, Patty Clark. Uh, Dr. Clark is with the Department of Behavioral Health, Developmental and, and, and Intellectual Div Disabilities, DBHDID. Um, and Dr. Clark, um, I'll let you take it away because I know you've got a lot to tell us about. Thank you, Marcy, and thank you guys all for um, inviting us to be here. I do not have slides, so I don't have uh, have to be compared with the incredible work of Medicaid and public health in, in the slide prep um, area. But I just do have some updates that I did want to share with you. And, and just, you know, the work here in, in the department is fast and furious. We all know that there is um, an identified mental health crisis. And so we are just looking at all of our resources and being very intentional about the way that we disseminate those um, those resources to our communities. So just to get us started, I did just wanna let you know that um, our commissioner, um, Wendy Morris, has accepted a position with the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors, or NASHFIT as we call it. I always mix up those um, acronyms. But as a result of her role, we're really excited. Um, she um, is just gonna be at the national level and we will get to continue to connect with her and the resources that she has access to there with the NASHFID group. That, that group actually uh, provides technical assistance and training for state mental health program directors across the country. In her place, Stephanie uh, Craycraft has been uh, named acting commissioner. Stephanie was the deputy commissioner and has a long tenure here in the department as well. I did want to just let you know, some of you may know this, but we underwent a major reorg in July of 22. And at that time, DBH, um, a Department for Behavioral Health, was actually split into two divisions, or Division of Behavioral Health, sorry, um, the Division of Substance Use Disorder and Division of Mental Health. And so within those two uh, divisions, we now have a prevention and treatment branch in the SUD division, as well um, our core staff sit in that division as well, Kentucky Op Opioid Response Effort. And then we have our adult mental health, children's behavioral health branches, as well as a new mental health promotion, prevention, and preparedness branch in the, um, the division of mental health, just recognizing uh, that we need to focus on mental health promotion and prevention, as well as address um, preparedness for disasters. If there's nothing else that we've learned from the last couple of years, it's that we have to be prepared uh, for just a multitude of impacts on our services. And so in that new branch, just to let you know, we have folks who are working on mental health uh, promotion and prevention, suicide prevention, our 988 implementation, our mobile crisis initiatives, as well as our disaster preparedness and recovery. Um, the Kentucky Community Crisis Response Team has also been assigned to DBHDID. And as a result, we are now supporting pro the provision of crisis counseling to our public safety employers or as you may know, our first responders, so law enforcement, fire, EMS, emergency management folks. Um, this is that uh, team has been in existence for about 20 years at this point, and we're excited to be able to incorporate their work within DBHDID. Um, 
And so we've spent a lot of time over the last six months really building up the workforce and the capacity of our team to be able to address the needs um, of the, the residents of the Commonwealth. And so I wanted to tell you just a little bit about some workforce initiatives that we have going on. We had, we've received a technology transfer um, initiative grant from NASHBID in December. It's focused on workforce and it will look at uh, standardizing the cross crisis call center position across, across our call centers. Um, and we know that when we have standardized onboarding, standardized job descriptions, et cetera, we have a better retention and recruitment rate with that sector. And so we are also hoping, hoping that, uh, anticipating that we will learn um, some lessons in this process that we can then translate to other sectors within our behavioral health workforce so that we can build that workforce as well. We also have an apprenticeship initiative at the Kentucky Correctional Psychiatric Center or KCPC. Um, that initiative is with the Kentucky Education and Labor Cabinet, as well as an additional uh, 40,000 grant to, to start our behavioral health technician registered apprenticeship program. Um, it, you may or may not know, but KCPC is one of the facilities that DBHDID uh, manages, and it is actually located on the grounds of Luther Luckett uh, Correctional Facility. So the initial worksite partners for this effort are Seven Counties Services and the Kentucky Correctional KCPC. And then if um, the program is successful in attracting candidates, to fill site vacancies. Um, the intent is to grow the registered apprenticeship model into other sectors as well. We are also working with the University of Kentucky for Excellence in Rural Health around uh, development of behavioral health track for community health workers. Um, the idea is that individuals who are in the community doing community health work would be trained to do some potentially some additional um, screenings for substance use, mental health issues, suicide risk as um, one more opportunity to access um, care across the state as well. Um, and then one more, I mean, so obviously we've, we've placed a high emphasis on getting our workforce up to speed and getting an additional pipeline in place, but we are working with the Council on Post-Secondary Education with their Healthcare Workforce Collaborative as well. And uh, the goal of that is to, um, to, the initiative is bringing leaders together to talk about um, solving that healthcare crisis, but also then to provide direct grants uh, to public institutions and um, funding research, et cetera, so that we can increase awareness of behavioral health as a, as a potential career. And uh, again, um, increase our pipeline. So as I mentioned earlier, 988 sits within the Division of Mental Health. I wanted to give you an update on uh, that implementation as well. We did receive our monthly report this morning, actually, so I was excited to get that so I could have up-to-date numbers for you. Um, our goal, just, just to kind of anchor this in your mind, is that we are answering 90% of the calls that originate in Kentucky, in Kentucky. So if if I pick up the call and I call, if I pick up the phone and I call 988, that call is going to originate in Kentucky. And we want that 90% of those calls to actually be answered by an in-state crisis call center. So at this point, we are at 76% um, that continues to climb when we really started focusing on improving our call rate back in uh, January of, 19, of 2019, we were at 48%. So you can see that we have uh, significantly increased those numbers and we continue to grow the capacity to answer our 988 calls. Um, we do see, see a continued increase in actual callers. Um, we saw a 5% increase um, in January compared to December. This is, this is pretty normal and was expected, you know, as there's more marketing about 988 that's out there, more stories, we absolutely will continue to see increase in calls coming in. Um, we also, um, the, Im the implementation in July of 2022, 2022 of, of 988 was what we call a soft launch. 
Um, and so we're not doing any major advertising at this point. And so everything that all the increases that we've seen so far have been a, a result of just the general information that's out there, as well as um, some of the some of the uh, more general advertising that has occurred. We do anticipate uh, ramping that up um, in July of 2023 after we've had a chance to really stress test our system and we um, we'll see how it goes as we, we expect those calls to continue to climb. Um, so we are still in the disaster space. Uh, we continue to provide services in Western Kentucky to those impacted by the December 2021 tornadoes and the July 2022 floods in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, we're wrapping up our crisis counseling grant for Western Kentucky with more than 20,000 residents reached by that effort. And then the crisis counseling grant for Eastern Kentucky has uh, reached about 15,000 over the last 16, six months at this point. We also administer case disaster case management grants for both areas with about 400 cases open across both of those regions. And the idea is that we're helping uh, support folks getting back into their homes, get them, um, the homes, the materials that they need, the supplies that they need to, to be able to re, uh, reestablish a, a residence. Um, we've talked about uh, some school mental health stuff. As I mentioned earlier, we, we created the branch, branch that will focus on mental health prevention and promotion. Uh, we continue to partner with KDE's Project AWARE. And we also learned recently that the Kentucky Educational Development Co-op in Eastern Kentucky has received a Project AWARE grant that will focus on Johnson, Floyd, and Bell counties. We will have a DBH staff person assigned to that grant and we will continue to support the original KDE Project AWARE grant that's in its fourth year. We are also aware that Project AWARE has received additional funding in the federal omnibus bill. We anticipate that will translate into additional funded sites for the next round of grant application, one of which just ended, and then we expect that a new uh, notice of funding opportunity will drop in the near future for the next round as well. We have started convening a CHF school mental health group so that we can avoid duplication of efforts and increased collaboration across multiple departments and branches in the cabinet. And then we are also planning to roll out a new toolkit that identifies the department's recommended policies, practices, and procedures related to suicide prevention efforts in the school setting. And this will help schools uh, more effectively meet the state legislation requirements that all middle and high school staff and students receive suicide prevention trainings by September 15th. And my last update is around um, the data waivers. Some of you may be, be aware that as a result of national legislation, the data waiver uh, to prescribe buprenorphine, I cannot say that word, um, has been uh, dropped. And so going forward, all prescriptions uh, only require um, a standard DEA registration number and the previously used data waiver registration numbers are no longer needed for any prescription. There are also no longer any limits or patient caps on the number of patients a prescriber may treat uh, for opioid use disorder with, with um, buprenorphine. Let's see how many times I can say it and mess it up. Um, you can use Suboxone, will... that's a little easier, right? Yeah, right. And so um, the DEA and SAMHSA will also introduce new training requirements for all DEA registrants in mid-2023. It's important to note that it doesn't impact existing state laws or regulations, uh, but we've had several of um, our entities that have made announcements. So the Kentucky Board of Medical License uh, says that with a valid DEA registration in Kentucky, prescribers may prescribe or dispense Suboxone um, monoproducts or combined with naloxone products if they conform to acceptable medical practices. Um, KBN has, Kentucky Board of Nursing has not adopted this change, um, despite the fact that X's will not be issued on licenses going forward. So it's too early. Uh, the board has said that they need to review the process and they don't have a timeline uh, for the promulgation or date of any amendments that may take effect. The Kentucky Board of Pharmacy has also issued a letter to all pharmacies stating that they can fill the scripts without the waiver. 
And, you know, just from our perspective, we are pleased to see the removal of the data waiver, waiver but we are concerned about the additional uh, burden of Kentucky training requirements. Um, we also know that the lack of adoption by the KBN is also problematic at this time and may have some impacts on being able to serve folks. So that's a whole lot of information, but um, I will um, stop there and see if there are any questions. So most of the questions are actually aimed at Medicaid, so we'll have to throw them their way. Um, awesome. So talking about waiver and things like that, um, I know you can't answer those questions. Uh, telehealth, though, I think you can probably speak to that. We're, we're not changing anything with that with the unwinding that you're aware of, right? Not that I'm so. aware of. Yep. Medicaid folks, feel free to, to answer questions in the chat because there are some good ones. There is an, the severe sure. mental illness waiver status has been another question. What was the second one? Where are we with the severe mental illness waiver? Um, mm -hmm. Still in development. That's my thought. <laughs> but I wanted to make sure. And then someone else wanted to know if they um, can do ABA therapy and mental health therapy uh, with the same patient, um, but different providers, I assume, Brian. I'm going to assume that. So <laughs> for minor children. Uh, I think my response to that is you need to uh, follow Medicaid's regulation with delivery of the service, ensuring you meet the qualifications. <laughs> Makes sense to me. And then Brian, if you need a, a advocate to help you navigate all that, feel free to reach out to me. Absolutely. My, yeah. My stuff in the chat. So, yeah, I don't see any other questions, so I will pass Marcy. it on to our next person. Marcy, I'm sorry. There are a couple. So we uh -huh. are in, the, uh, somebody asked about when um, there would be a new person assigned to the Mental Health and Aging Coalition with the retirement of Cheryl Bogarty. We are in the process of getting that position posted. And as you may or may not know, it takes uh, several months for that to happen, but that is definitely on our list. So we will be taking, uh, moving that forward as quickly as possible. Um, thanks, Marcy, for putting those uh, links into the chat for me around 988, uh, the Council on Post-Secondary and KCPC. Um, you can definitely look for Project Recovery, uh, KY.com. And then, um, Bev, just in, in response to the CHWs, we will, um, it, we're just getting started. And so it will take, um, take some time for that to happen. But we hope to, I think this is a three-year grant, um, so we hope to get them started, at least with piloting, uh, relatively uh, soon, as in the next six months or so, uh, with some initial um, components. But obviously, there's training that needs to go with that as well. Um, I'll there's put it in now. Now. Patty, as soon as they Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, if there's additional questions, um, let's get to them in the chat. And I'm going to quickly pass it to Dustin and Andrea to get to the child care portion because we are getting a little squeezed on time. So, Dustin. Yeah, we've got uh, nine minutes left to get through 20 minutes of presentation, so we can do it. Um, uh, I actually had a much longer intro planned for Andrea, um, who is our director of the Division of Child Care. Um, but I'll just quickly say that child care is the industry that supports all other industries, and it's a critical service uh, to Kentuckians at their most um, critical stage. So uh, there have been a lot of really important and kind of incredible changes to child care assistance and um, supports to the industry as a whole, and there are more changes coming. So we asked Andrea to come and update us on those. Thank you very much for having me on today. Um, I'll try to make this quick. That way Todd has some time left for uh, PEBT and SNAP. Um, like you said, there's a lot going on in childcare. Um, we continue to see our CCAP enrollment increase. We've put forth several new initiatives. Um, one of the biggest being increasing that eligibility threshold from 200% of the federal poverty guideline to 85% SMI um, since July. That has benefited over 2,000 families and about over 3,000 children. So that's something that we're really uh, proud of. We also started the child care employee income exclusion at the very end of October last year. Um, so far, um, that has benefited 2,074 families, and that's 3,500 children. Um, one thing that we are doing a deeper dive into is looking at how many of those families 
would have qualified for CCAP had they applied. Um, in the month of December, it was about two thirds of those would have been eligible for CCAP under traditional guidelines. Um, so we will continue um, working on that, spreading the word for folks to participate in that. Um, in January, we released another uh, ARPA sustainability payment. There are three more of the ARP uh, sustainability payments to go out this year. Um, those will be end in September of 2023 as far as ARP goes. Um, we also are paying child care on enrollment versus attendance, which is a benefit to providers for sure because they're getting paid for those slots even when children aren't present. Um, and we are also paying the parent copay portion. Um, and we plan to do that for the rest of this calendar year. Um, House Bill 499 is the other large topic. Um, those That reg has been heard now before the Administrative Regulation Review Subcommittee, the Senate uh, Families and Children Committee. It will be heard Thursday on the House. So we um, anticipate for that to pass. We are working on a marketing campaign. Um, we hope to have some information out within the next couple of weeks that you know we will uh, push out to all of our, our partners um, to really get the word out and to get some excitement going with not only employees, but employers, because this is a huge benefit um, for um, their employees. So um, I know that was very quick. Um, so if there's any questions, I'll be happy to take those. That was incredible. Um, we will uh, collect questions in the chat and then send them on to you um, if we have any, but I really appreciate that update. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to Jessica to talk about food assistance. Thanks, Dustin. And I know we, we only have a, a few minutes left and so much to cover under food assistance. Um, so I just will say, you know, it's been particularly important that we get folks to the food assistance that they need, particularly with the end of emergency allotments and the increase in food prices over the past year. Um, and we currently have over 553,000 Kentuckians participating in the SNAP program and even more families receiving grocery money through PEBT. Um, there's been a couple of federal changes recently and then lots going on statewide with new programs. So Todd Trapp, director of um, the Department or Division of Family Support, what do you have for us in terms of SNAP and PEBT? Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the introduction. Thanks for giving me some time. I'll try to uh, move forward as fast as I can. Uh, I'll start with PEBT. We've submitted our school year PEBT plan. That'd be the 22-23 school year plan. Um, and we've ha had just a brief exchange with FNS. We still haven't gotten that approved, but it's in process. So uh, we continue to work on that. And then uh, the summer PEBT was delinked from that. It's not a part of that plan. So we'll be submitting that with that one separately. We've not yet done that. Um, and we do have a draft and it's in process and we should be submitting that one uh, shortly. I will just make a note that uh, uh, summer PEBT will not be available to the, the child care age group this year, and that's because of the, the ending of the uh, PHE in, in May. So I just wanted to note that to everyone. Um, let's see, there, the Omnibus also made a summer EBT uh, program available drop the P in 2024. That's the way I remember. Um, summer EBT will be available in 2024. Uh, that we, we haven't started work on that plan yet, obviously. Um, we're just waiting for more guidance on that. I would assume we would uh, make that sometime, you know, within the next calendar year. But that's what we know on that so far. Also, in, in, in that, um, with the signature of that act, there, there's a, a skimming plan do um, by, I believe it's February 27th is the actual day. Uh, and I say skimming, it's actually benefit theft, really. It's SNAP benefit theft. It doesn't have to be skimming. It, it covers skimming. It covers cloning. Co covers a, a few different methods of theft. Um, but we have a plan due, and what it allows us to do is SNAP recipients who have 
been a victim of that, we can replace two months worth of benefits for them um, within, I think it's a 12 uh, a month period. This plan will actually cover a 24 month period, October 22nd, I mean, October of 2022 through September 30th of 2024. Um, following that, we expect it to be a part of the farm bill. So it'll just be part of the regular SNAP program. Uh, but our plan, once approved, will allow us to replace up to two months worth of benefits uh, once we get those procedures in place. Uh, what we're talking about is something like a, uh, an affidavit that the uh, person would have to sign, um, you know, test of, testifying that they've or attesting, I should say, that they have uh, they were a victim of this. And then, of course, we'll verify that through the, the EBT system. So that's sort of the gist of that. Um, another update would be um, the ABOD work requirements. We, uh, upon notice of the ending of the PHE, uh, we know that the work requirements will have been again be effective the month following the month. Uh, and so I think for us, that means July will be the first month that ABODs, able bodied adults without dependents, um, SNAP recipients who, who meet that definition will be subject to those work requirements uh, again in July. Now, another aspect of that is we also basically reset the clock for those ABODs for that group. They're, they're required, they're only allowed to receive SNAP benefits uh, three months in a 36 month period if they're not meeting those work requirements. Uh, but upon this date, basically we're gonna, I say we're gonna wipe everybody's uh, slate clean. Really we're starting the period over. And if you think about it, it's been three years since there were any, these requirements were in effect anyway. So that wasn't a, a big task for us, but everybody will start from zero um, and then be required to participate. Now, also there will be 39 counties that will uh, be eligible for a waiver of those work requirements. And I can provide those, um, you know, at a later time. So that's sort of the gist of that. Certainly any questions, send them to me. Um, let's see what else I have not covered. There are three things uh, in House Bill 7 that I want to touch on. One, and these are all in progress, so there's no implementation date. One is an elderly simplified, assist, uh, simplified application uh, program. Basically, it'll be a subset of the SNAP population. It'll lift some administrative burden on them allows for longer certification periods flexibility in what we can verify and what we can use data matches to verify another thing is a standard medical deduction uh, which will be which will help certain populations in the, uh, uh, in snap and then um, a transitional benefit program which will be actually that'll help a small group right now it'll it'll help KTAP, which is our TANF program, KTAP recipients who have uh, lost their KTAP benefit, it'll provide an extended period and I think an increased amount of SNAP benefits for a period after they lose their, uh, their TANF benefit. So more to come on that. Those things are in progress right now. So uh, we're probably about time, if not over. So send me any questions. Thank you. We, we are at time. Jessica, I'll let you, if you have any closing thoughts, otherwise I can't imagine another way I'd rather spend my Valentine's Day afternoon, um, except for getting all of these updates and spending a much a robust and thorough presentation. We will be sending all of this in an email to everyone as a follow-up. Um, please join us month to month. So much changes. And as you saw today, it will continue to change a lot over the next several months. Um, and other than that, have a wonderful safe afternoon.